and my pleasure to give you the floor. Benjamin Haddad. That's you. I, yes. I think yes. so. Yes. Yes. Hi. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Benjamin Haddad. Uh, I'm part of Accenture. Um, I'm based in Israel, uh, where I run a team uh, at Accenture that's focused on cybersecurity innovation. So this is what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, we will keep, I guess, questions for the panel mostly, but uh, please also feel free to interrupt me. I'll try and be on time. I think uh, we have more than enough with the few slides that I have. So um, cybersecurity innovation um, is something uh, part of a much bigger discussion that is ongoing at Accenture and relates to the partnerships that we have um, with very mature companies. Um, as the largest consulting group in the world, a big part of what we do is actually uh, solving client problems by helping them implement the technology choices that they have made. Uh, for example, you see here logos like Intel and like SAP perhaps and, uh, and others uh, that are mature technology companies that solve uh, well-known problems. The relationship with the hottest startup, which is the bottom part of this, of this slide, is the ventures part and is about really uh, realization and accepting at the leadership level of uh, Accenture worldwide that the current partnerships, the current established alliances that we have with technology players today, like Microsoft, like all the big names that everybody knows here, um, are going to change, are going to change, and they're going to change much faster than, than we think. This has been mentioned today, in part due to new technologies. Uh, just look at cloud, which until five years ago was really a vague concept that only a few people could talk about, and today, Microsoft generates 17 billion out of cloud, uh, so does uh, Google, so does a number of other players, IBM, and, and there is a very long tail. Um, I think Alibaba grows its cloud business at 100% year on year. Um, and, and, and this is true through, uh, throughout a number of technology domains. Everybody speaks about blockchain, everybody speaks about AI. So our role as a corporate in helping our clients to identify the right uh, game changer is really one that is taken very seriously with a constant relationship uh, with the hottest startup. We track 200,000 startups globally. And our role there is to uh, utilize the uh, expertise that we have with 400,000 employees. Some of them have a very strong expertise in a technology domain in a very specific area. Some of them understand very well an industry, the problems of an industry, the problem of a client within that industry. And matching all of that, uh, all of that global cross-industry expertise, we think we have uh, a lot of advantage to put at the table to identify faster the next generation winners. And so the approach is really one uh, that looks like a bridge, uh, essentially, and, uh, and that talks about you know, an, an asymmetric information problem. There has been, uh, and it's very well documented, it's not a new problem, uh, but the journey to innovation, uh, I'm sorry to say, is, is, is a major failure. <laughs> it's a, it's a, do you have had so many tech bubbles that have exploded because people uh, jumped the guns, went way too quickly into uh, thinking that this is the next thing, and uh, burned cash, uh, destroyed value in the company, and, and this is uh, something that we think we can uh, help solve because it, the fact that it hasn't worked doesn't mean that it's not needed anymore. There's a lot of statistics speaking about global 2000 corporates and the rate of uh, disappearance of these global 2000 corporates. If you were a corporate in the 50s, you would have a chance to survive that is much stronger than a chance of today to survive. This is again due to technology change, business model innovation, yet, uh, on the other side of the equation, the startup word is a, is a very risky word. Uh, there is a mortality rate of about 80%, meaning uh, within three years, 80% of startups fail and disappear. That, that creates uh, inherently a very big problem to really engage with these clusters of innovation. Obviously, there are other problems, which is it is extremely hard to test and then deploy uh, innovation at scale. Um, there is a thing uh, that we call the death after the POC, 
many startups, especially in the earlier stages of their development, are looking for a proof of concept. And, and this is you know, the first signs of traction that they have with a client. But due to um, you know, current uh, legacy systems, due to current bureaucracy, due to inertia, due to a number of reasons, it is extremely hard for many large corporates to move a startup from something that is just a proof of concept on a small scale to, to, to understand whether it works to full-scale implementation. And so there is a huge paradox with a lot of innovation on one side. Uh, we track 200,000 startups globally. 200,000 startups globally, and there are more, uh, which is gigantic. And on the other side, a need for innovation, but also a difficulty to apply the innovation on a big scale. And so us, as you know, Accenture, we think that uh, methodology and discipline, uh, program management, and consulting around a roadmap to change can help solve some of this uh, asymmetry that you, are, that you have described in this bridge. We're present as a, as a global network uh, and, and leverage the footprint of Accenture around the world to do exactly this job, meaning all these dots that you see here around the world are people like me that are uh, meeting everyday entrepreneurs to understand you know, what they're up to, uh, meeting everyday venture capitalists to understand why they have invested in this one and not in this one, and really maintaining uh, a relationship with key ecosystems of innovation. In my case, uh, I'm based in Israel, as I was mentioning before. You know, it's called Startup Nation to some people. It's, the more appropriate name should be the Cybersecurity Nation. Uh, it attracts, it, it is second in the world for venture capital investment in cybersecurity. There are about 500 cybersecurity investments, um, startups, investments in uh, accelerators, investments in R&D doing security. It's a very small and highly co-located cluster of cybersecurity innovation where obviously it's exciting to do the job, but more importantly, uh, it provides us with a benefit to work with um, our partners, our clients all around the world, uh, and let them access this innovation. Uh, if you are a small firm, uh, it is perhaps much harder to get access to those pools of innovation. Uh, of, of course, you can do the random trip to Silicon Valley and to London and to other ecosystems and to Israel. But uh, maintaining on a continuous basis the pulse with what's happening, what's hot, what's coming, what is valuable, what is less valuable, is extremely expensive. And even if you can do it, maybe if you're a bigger firm, we still think that you know, uh, a bank remains a bank. And therefore, they will maybe not have exactly the same uh, level of technology expertise that we can bring at the table by being exclusively focused on that as a, as a consulting shop. So, we do it on a continuous basis, and uh, you know, in Israel, for example, maintain relationship with Teammate, which is a joint venture that creates uh, startups on a continuous basis, uh, and others like accelerators, etc. Now, what's really funny, uh, I think, in, in in cybersecurity is that you have sort of a um, replica of the startup mentality, but amplified. What I mean by that is simply that every entrepreneur, and we maybe don't state that in a very explicit way in those very polished slides, but typically startup entrepreneurs are looking to replace the statu quo. There is an inherent, uh, uh, not violence, but desire to change what is existing and bring a solution that you as an entrepreneur believe is better. It's exactly the same uh, mentality that you are seeing in cybersecurity, sometimes politically motivated, sometimes not. Uh, but there is a motivation from hackers to impact organizations, nation states, in a very radical way and sometimes completely destructive way, somewhat similar to uh, entrepreneurs. Um, Microsoft has not become Microsoft because it ticked all the boxes, if you know what I mean. They, they, they also did some stuff that you know, today you would think. Uh, is not politically correct. And this, this, this slide talks a little bit about that, but also about another thing. Uh, essentially, here, you know, if you allow me for the analogy, I think today we, in cybersecurity, were something like in the Middle Ages uh, in Europe, where you had all the kings of this little region building their own castle, beautiful castles, and reacting to the neighbor by building the highest possible wall. That's the very bottom part of this, of this, uh, of this uh, chart, hard perimeter security. Up until recently, meaning 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, cybersecurity was only a matter of choosing a firewall, 
choosing an antivirus, choosing a, a firewall, and you, were, you had a cybersecurity program, so-called. This is, this is the Middle Ages still today in many, many places all around the world. The vast majority of people don't have a sophisticated equipment for cybersecurity threats, and it is about building the highest possible wall, just a firewall, which is fine. You need to do the basis. It's OK. Uh, but, um, but I guess some people are realizing that hard perimeter security is just not enough. Back to the analogy, uh, today, one out of two attacks um, and data theft involve an insider, involve a compromised access uh, of your employee. And that basically means that it's the people within your castle, your corporate citizens, your, 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 the people that you less suspect to uh, be involved in an attack that are actually in need to be monitored, to be understood, uh, if they log at strong, strange areas, uh, in strange IPs, in strange locations. There is uh, definitely, you know, you could call them a tier two of more sophisticated people that uh, do this kind of, you know, uh, behavioral mon monitoring, risk-based metrics, etc., all the way to operate effectively and, and, and be maybe a little bit more proactive in, rather than reactive in um, protecting against threats. But there's definitely no finish line. This is going to uh, evolve. This, this, this curve is virtually uh, infinite, and you, and you recognize it from, from the title as well. There has been a constant uh, reactivity to the industry, both on the client side and on the startup side, to the hackers. I think in cybersecurity, the, the, the difference with any technology domain is that uh, the driver to innovation is not scale, but it's the sophistication and the complexity of the attacks. And this is really growing. We are seeing, uh, some people have talked about IoT growing the complexity. It's absolutely true. Cloud is still not so well understood. Blockchain, it's even worse. And uh, today, attackers have uh, a huge drive, often backed by nation states, to create ever more complex attacks, and there is a, an explosion of malwares. I'm, I'm, I'm going to use this slide, actually, just for that specific point. There are many good reasons uh, in cybersecurity for the adoption of uh, artificial intelligence-led solutions. Um, it is well known that there are too many jobs outstanding that cannot be filled in cybersecurity. I was just reading now there are 3.5 million jobs outstanding in the world in cybersecurity that are not filled, not match. You do not have enough CVs that can match with the offers in the cybersecurity world. Skill shortage is a major, major issue. Uh, when I did this uh, slide, as you can see, one million security job remain unfulfilled. This was a slide from last year. This boomed from one million to 3.5 million this year. <laughs> it, it, it is absolute, and so given the skill shortage, um, the drive to adopt solutions that can do what human people could do in theory is huge, right? Because it allows you to utilize the few personnel, the few people that you actually can find to do the higher end tasks. And rising costs, obviously, and new threats are all, all of these. I won't stop too long on this, on this slide, uh, but if you look at the bottom part, back to the increasing sophistication and complexity of attacks. Uh, there is today a uh, emerging trend, but clearly exploding, around AI uh, threats, meaning malwares are learning how to penetrate your perimeter as they attack you. Maybe the first time they weren't so the malware wasn't itself so successful, but the malware uh, are being coded to learn from their unsuccessful penetration and, and become more successful as they go. And, and, so, and, and this, is, this is something that, you know, again, speaks about the increasing resources of uh, some threat actors, nation states. Some of them have been mentioned. Some of them have not been mentioned. We know who they are. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but it creates a huge drive, I think, for this slide, which looks extremely complicated, but it basically says one simple thing. Uh, you, you, you better start with... Uh, Whatever you, you are, uh, what business you are in, uh, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, you could burn your cash in cybersecurity so fast, just like with any innovation. Uh, it is our point of view and a firm point, you know, uh, uh, conviction 
that it is much better to start with the prioritization of your need. First, try some, some people have speak, spoken here about vulnerability assessment. They are definitely part of the picture. We, we believe that you know, whether you're in financial services, which is FS here, or you're in uh, resources, a natural gas company, uh, rather than going first to the market of the solution, to the exciting ecosystems of innovators and meet plenty of startups, uh, there is an advantage in first trying to work out the use case that you should prioritize for capital allocation. Understand if you are most exposed to an attack on your data center or if it's the mobile phones that you give to your employees that are not well secured. Start with that. Forget the solutions, really understand your environment, your, your uh, vulnerabilities, and then map that uh, perhaps with two or three innovators. Again, each of these blue boxes have hundreds of innovators within it. You can imagine you double click on the blue box and you would have all the map of the innovators, hundreds, very often. We think again, uh, you should talk to three of them after you have understood the dark blue blocks for your specific case. That's, that's the approach that we propose uh, as Accenture. Uh, and, it's, and it's really, um, you know, the name of my team is Accenture Ventures, but I think it's very different from most corporate ventures team in the sense that we're not an arms length financial uh, arm that just take bets, but we very much believe that it's on the basis of use cases and on of documented problems and priorities that our clients have that we can discover the future and understand what entrepreneurs has a better chance to reinvent the future and what maybe not. So, so this is really the approach where we say, okay, discover, discover, prioritize, uh, documented very well to then map and understand you know how this problem relates to the external world again uh, you know prioritize there don't meet everybody there are, there is uh, there there is uh, I think time to market that can be accelerated but then it's a continued journey that we're proposing where we're saying Working with a small startup, even if it is not so small anymore and it has you know, several rounds of investment and it's quite mature and many clients, a startup is still a startup. Um, it is uh, something a little bit funny that I do as a you know, day to day is that you discover in working with startups from very early on to fairly late in their development is that startups have a natural tendency to uh, overpromise and, and under deliver. It's, it's, it's not because they're bad faith or they're, they're liars, not at all. It's, it, it's just that from their perspective, uh, there is a route to uh, solving a solution sometimes that's much simpler than the actual reality of a complex client or the actual inertia of a complex client or the culture of a, of a client, et cetera. And so we think as Accenture that there is a role uh, to, for someone in the middle that's neutral to project manage, to guide, uh, to measure the results, to service this, you know, if it works well, to have a roadmap on how to implement it on a much bigger scale, rather than just finding the right, part, finding the right priority, the right partner, and then disappearing. So we, we, we very much believe in, an, in a, you know, accompanied journey um, that starts with vision and strategy. I'll skip this slide because I see I have only two minutes. I'll give you an example in GDPR, which is not only, of course, a cybersecurity question, but definitely one of those strategic priorities where people are willing to put uh, budget against it to find partners that will help them solve this compliance, uh, this huge compliance issue. So uh, this slide is a sort of uh, illustration of how noisy the ecosystem is. As, as you can see, the, bl the blue buckets, security risk assessment, compliance analysis and report, all of these are categories from the GDPR regulation. And, uh, and then some clients will have a very high uh, rating of uh, one bucket in red. Some others will have a green. But it's not so important because they're already equipped. So what we do is mapping their priorities to a few uh, recommended players that seem to have a mature solution that can be scaled on a bigger, on a bigger, and and uh, and work with them then to project manage the relationship, measure the result, uh, and basically say to the client, working with a very small startup can be a huge distraction. Uh, you are busy people, uh, you need that innovation, but. Sometimes uh, excessive aggressivity from the startup and ambition means that they will drive you nuts for one small uh, line of the NDA. Give us that complexity. Give us also the complexity of managing the whole relationship for more than just a product. Because obviously, 
startups are known for technology, for good innovations, and but they fail in all the other things, in, in, in support, uh, in, all the, in all the operational uh, model. And so we manage that as a service, all the research as well. This is a typical the, you know, collaboration that we run uh, at a client where we manage the project as a pilot, measure the result, understand really what needs to be done if it's successful to be implemented on a larger scale. But then also in the third wave, services service it on an ongoing basis, whether it's for support, whether it's for research. Support, I mean first level support, right? People of the software calling and saying it's not working. And, and sometimes it goes as far as being a full uh, SOC management. Uh, not just one product support, but a full security operation center of a client, of a group of clients uh, that are then all of a sudden equipped with uh, best-in-class tools. I'll end on the last 30 seconds here um, with a view of the Israeli ecosystem. I think uh, one of the reasons that uh, I was kind of invited here was to grow the relationship between these two uh, interesting clusters of, uh, of uh, on one side, obviously, industrial power, and on the other side, uh, innovation. Um, this is something that uh, we are seeing in Israel uh, as a, a very relevant reason why um, Israel has built a world-class ecosystem of innovation. There has been long history in building uh, these pillars but essentially, I think one of the reasons why you are going to see more and more innovation uh, in cybersecurity coming from Israel, just like you have in the last 10 years, is that you have a very vibrant uh, and healthy uh, set of uh, you know, players, whether it's venture capital, um, whether it's R&D centers. There are 350 R&D centers of large corporates doing security innovation. Uh, the role of government uh, is, is huge, etc. So. Uh, I'll end here on an invite uh, for you, all of you to come and visit us in Israel. We would be very happy to, to host you, uh, maybe for a safari, as we call it, a digital safari. Um, and then, obviously, if you want to speak more about, you know, how can we increase uh, maybe the um, bringing of innovation into this small enterprise world, I'd be happy as, as well to connect. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you.